Welcome everyone to Science Starter Live. Uh, we do this every week where we talk to a different project and discuss what is going on in their project and what we can do to help the citizen scientists and also get a good idea as to what, um, what it means to participate in one of these. I'm going to drop my share now that you can see that re-beginning screen and introduce our guest again, uh, Dr. Caitlin Potter. Do you wanna introduce yourself once more for everyone? Absolutely. Hi everyone, I'm super excited to be here. Um, my name is Caitlin. I am the Associate Director at Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve. Um, I'll show you some slides that give you some context about what we do at the reserve. Basically, we're a piece of land in East Central Minnesota that has been home to science projects for at least the last 80 years under the auspices of the University of Minnesota and for many, many generations before that um, in use by mostly Ojibwe and to some extent Dakota people um, for science as well as for gathering and life in general. Um, so we're home to a whole range of interesting projects. Um, and I'm really excited to share one with you today, which is our Eyes on the Wild trail camera project. I'm gonna start with a disclaimer that I will come back to at a couple of points during this talk. We are in the process of uploading the latest season of images. I have been pushing for it to be uploaded and ready to go for you today. Um, but apparently the hard drive that has the latest batch of images on it has gotten corrupted. And so there's been a little hiccup in the upload process that we're working on fixing. Um, but Emma has promised that she will send out a blast to all of you um, when we do have our new season up, which I'm hoping will be very soon. Um, and she'll also talk a little bit about how you can put this project onto your SciStarter dashboard so you can automatically find out um, and check back in easily as new seasons get uploaded. With that, I'm going to start sharing my screen um, and start this slideshow, hopefully on the right side. We'll see in a moment. Yes, here we go. Um, I'll also say that I'm very happy to answer questions about the project as we go through these slides. Um, if you have questions that are less about the project and more about science in general, or me in general, or me in specific, um, drop them in the chat and Emma will make sure that I see them as we get toward the end of things. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, um, I'm gonna be talking today about our Eyes on the Wild project. Uh, this is a collaboration that is headed actually not by me, um, but by an ecologist named Dr. Forrest Isbell. He's the gentleman on the left in that set of four. Um, this is his, his research project of which I'm a collaborator. Um, also working on this project is Dr. Dave Meach, who's one of the world's foremost experts in wolves specifically, um, and Dr. Meredith Palmer, um, who currently works for Flora Fauna International and is really involved with conservation technology um, and finding ways to kind of bring technology into the mix to answer big conservation questions so that scientists can get the data that they need, communities can be involved with this sort of work, basically bringing citizens in science to a whole new level. So she's been really instrumental in making sure that our trail cameras function um, and all of the systems are go. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking about kind of three sub questions that we're trying to answer with our cameras. What animals live at the reserve? How do all sorts of things like population dynamics, behavior, abundance, interactions, things like that change over seasons and across years? And then one question specifically that we're interested in about wolves, which is how does everything else on the landscape change? Things like prey animals, things like vegetation and soil, how do how do all those things fit together in a trophic cascade when you add a top predator like a wolf to the mix? So a little bit of background. Um, as I mentioned, Cedar Creek is a University of Minnesota field station. Our mission is to discover sustainable solutions to environmental challenges through research, conservation, education, and community engagement. Um, so we've been working at our site in East Central Minnesota kind of under this name since 1942 officially, so just over 80 years now. Um, but there, of course, have been people and projects going on in this area for a very, very long time. It's a really cool part of the state where many different ecosystems come together, and that means there's a huge diversity of wildlife, a huge diversity of plant communities, and a lot of interesting things to study. 
One of the things that I love most about the Eyes on the Wild project specifically is that it really does fulfill our mission. It really does touch on all of these different approaches in a way that most science projects don't. So the work that goes on at Cedar Creek in general is very research focused. We have people studying climate change, studying biodiversity loss, studying water and aquatic systems, purely research perspective. We obviously have hypothesis driven research questions on Eyes on the Wild as well, and I'll talk about some of those questions and the results, but we do so much more than that with this project. We, we have really direct ties into conservation. We're trying to study rare species, rare landscapes, and interactions between both rare and common species so that we can do a good job of kind of moving forward into a world where all of these different dynamics can continue to thrive. We have a really strong educational component. Um, if I remember, and hopefully Emma can remind me at the end of this, I can drop a link in the chat um, with a link to some educational resources that we've built that go with this project. Um, we bring this into schools all over the state, um, and we're happy to bring it into schools broader than Minnesota via Zoom. Um, we have worksheets, we have bingo cards that have been translated into a variety of languages. Um, we have opportunities for field trip groups to come up and do things like these summer campers you see on the screen, setting up their own trail camera. And then we also have obviously a big community engagement piece. Um, which is the interface that you can get through through SciStarter, where anyone anywhere with an internet connection can help us with our work. Our general kind of approach to, to this project is that we've set up about 100 trail cameras on a grid that covers the entire reserve, so 100 cameras over about 5,600 acres. Each of the cameras is mounted at the same height, looking at the same angle, we try and take as much of that variation out as we can, and then we document the other variation um, that exists on the landscape. So we go out to these places and we write down what plants are nearby, what the view is like, how far the camera is from the road, that kind of stuff. Um, we started off trying to get to each of our cameras about once a season, so four times a year. Um, we've pretty quickly drop that because it is a lot of work to walk out to 100 cameras four times a year, um, especially given that some of these are in swampy and marshy areas that are pretty challenging to get to for most of the year. So we do still service the easy to access ones about four times a year, and some of the other ones just get checked in the winter when the swamps are frozen um, or on slightly different schedules. But we do get out to them and change SD cards, change batteries quite a few times each year. And over the course of the year, these cameras collect about 1.5 million images. So you can see why we need SciStarter folks like you all to help, because I cannot go through 1.5 million images myself. Okay, let's dive into the questions. Um, one of our first big questions is, who lives at Cedar Creek? Cedar Creek is a hotbed for mostly plant and community, plant community focused research, um, not as much for wildlife research at the moment. And so just getting a baseline look at what sort of species call our landscape home is a driving push behind this, behind this project. Um, you can see a few of the answers to who lives here up on the screen. Um, we've got a fisher, which is a weasel that lives in Minnesota. We've got a deer and a newborn fawn. Um, we've got a pair of sandhill cranes, and we've got a bear investigating the camera. So quite a lot of variety. Um, and now is where you get to come in. Um, I've shown you four species. How many species do you think over the last six years or so, um, we have photographed on this network of trail cameras. Somewhere around 10, somewhere around 15, or somewhere around 30. I don't want to be too optimistic, and I also can't answer, but I'm just trying to think through what I would answer. And I feel like it's just such a big jump from 15 to 30, it's doubling. But it's true. Yeah. yeah. I was a little bit worried since I showed four. I originally had like five, 15, 30. And then I was like, well, I've already shown everybody four. Five seems like too few for a first question. <laughs> Definitely. We got about 84 responses or 84% responses. Any last people? Three, 
two, one. All right, who's wrong? <laughs> oh man, I can't even see what the poll oh. results are. We've got 19% um, of people said 15 and 81% said 30, but no one said 10. Well, you all, you all are on the money. Um, we have documented 29 species to date um, on the cameras that we can identify. And there are more that show up as like blurs and smudges that we're less <laughs> confident in our ID of. So we do have some like other small mammal, other bird kind of categories, um, but 30 plus, which is pretty good, I would say, for these cameras. We know that we have many more species than that, of course, at Cedar Creek. I think we are up on our official list to 58 mammal species and about 240 bird species, but these cameras are not really designed to kind of sample all of the birds, as you can imagine, and there's a lot of the mammals that live underground or live primarily in the water that are also hard to capture. So 30 on a set of terrestrial cameras is pretty remarkable. Here are a few more um, of kind of the fan favorite bunch. One of my favorite captures from a couple of years ago was this pair of frolicking bear cubs. Um, we do generally have four to six active bear dens on the property. Um, and sometimes they produce cubs that run in front of the cameras. We have inquisitive raccoons. We have goldfinches that like to come and investigate the camera housing very closely, leading to some of these funny, far too close images. Um, we have a research herd of bison in the summer. Um, and sometimes they, well, a lot of the time, they show up on camera as well. Um, we have documented wolves on the property. So that top left is a picture of a wolf. Um, we'll talk more about them in a moment. We get deer at all different times of the year and all sorts of weather conditions. We even get fun pictures of research in progress. So on the bottom left, you can see some of our interns building some fencing for the Trophic Cascades project that I'll talk about later on today. Um, and up in the top right, you can see some of our researchers working on a prescribed burn, studying the role of fire on our landscapes. So really a mix of everything. One thing that I really love about the way these trail cameras work is that you do start to get this glimpse into the life of the wildlife on the property. Um, so all these pictures I should mention are, are ones that volunteers have tagged as they've been going through and classifying and saying what animals they find. Um, and then they write little comments that bring them to my attention. And a few years ago, somebody found this great set, actually several someone's found this great set of coyote pups playing in the woods late at night. Um, and I was able to stitch them together into a little video. So here, here's a family of coyote pups um, running around, having a blast at four in the morning on the 4th of July. Uh, and then later that night, back in the same place around midnight, no doubt wreaking havoc and keeping their parents up, um, but having a grand old time. So these are a lot of fun because you really do start to see things that you're unlikely to just stumble across when you're out in the course of your field work. And let's see if I can get to the next slide. We might just have to continue watching this video on loop forever. I think, oh, there you go. Um, we also get get magical moments with some of our avian life. Um, here is a pair of sandhill cranes, which are an incredible bird that migrates up from Florida and in the spring um, do these amazing courtship dances on the property. So we were lucky in 2021 to have a pair of sandhill cranes courting right in front of the camera. And this actually has been a really great spot. Um, if you keep in your mind kind of what this scene looks like and especially that log on the back right of things, the fallen log, this spot will show up again, I think in one of our coyote videos in a moment. Maybe even the next moment, go. <laughs> oh, not quite the next moment. Um, we get things that surprise the researchers as well. So in this instance, we know we have otters at Cedar Creek, but we tend to find them in and around the creek. Um, if any of you are from North America, which I know many of you are from the chats, um, you might be familiar with river otters. They do travel on land, but they're generally found in lakes and rivers. 
except in the middle of winter, as it turns out, when they come sliding through the woods. Um, this camera is not incredibly far as the otter goes from a creek, but it would, I mean, it would probably take me five or 10 minutes walk certainly longer than that in the snow and so to have some volunteers pick up these otters and say these look like otters but it doesn't make sense um, was a really fun find these cameras really are great at kind of giving some insight into what's happening when the scientific community is not around keeping an eye on the world okay one more video and then we'll move on to some other results besides just who lives here. This is a little corny. Um, it's a like a iMovie trailer that I put together um, in 2020 in the heart of the pandemic when everything was sad and lonely and there was a really sweet kind of day long compilation of a coyote uh, at the spot where those sandhill cranes were courting. Um, so there's some corny music, and I hope you enjoy a day in the life of a coyote. Just so relatable. Coyote, they're just like us, right? I just love how he curls up into his little ball and like thinks about getting up, goes back to sleep. Um, so the cameras really do kind of bring, bring the wildlife at Cedar Creek to life. Of course, it's more than just like fun, silly pictures and things we can make into videos. Um, Though that is a lot of what my role in the project is uh, as one of the like communication people and the person that interacts the most with the volunteers. Um, we do also do real science and one of the things that we're starting to look at are seasonal patterns of all of these animals on the landscape. So this is a mess of graphs along the X axis is the month of the year from January to December and those bars show how many times a particular species was documented in that month. So we can start putting together results like this that give us a chance to see which animals are active when. We can look at these patterns hold across many different years, how they vary um, over time and how they vary between species. I want to zoom in on four specific species that have some interesting patterns and give you some insight into how we use these data. So I want to zoom in on squirrels, foxes, bats, and deer. Um, if you're a North American attendee today, these are animals that you're probably quite familiar with. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy seeing kind of the way that looking at something as simple as how many pictures get taken can give us insight into what these animals are doing on the landscape. So to zoom in on squirrels, when I look at this squirrel data, I see a really obvious peak in the fall. Um, right over that number 10, the bar is really high. Um, the 10th month is October. Why are there so many squirrels being photographed on cameras in October and November? Not a poll question, but you can think about it in your heads. Acorns. So these cameras give us some insight, even if we don't actually see 
um, the squirrels running around and picking up acorns on the camera. Um, we know that that is a important time for storing acorns for the winter. And we can look, for example, at the abundance of acorns in one year to the next and whether we see any differences in the number of squirrels that we see active from one year to the next. This year, for example, um, we've just gotten results from our annual acorn survey back, and it is by far the most abundant burr oak acorn year that we've had in the last 25 years. So it'll be really interesting to see if this peak jumps up um, for 2023. Moving down to this very blurry, you can hardly read the species graph. Um, this is a graph of fox photos. And I don't see a peak in November. I instead see a peak around March. We see a lot of photos of foxes in February, March, around then. Why do we see so many pictures of foxes in the middle of winter? This one's a little trickier than the acorn question. But a good one, if you know anything about wild canids, particularly in kind of the northern part of, of the United States, this is mating season. Um, so coyotes, foxes, wolves, a lot of those species will mate kind of in late winter so that by the time their gestation period ends, it's getting into spring and it's a little bit easier for parents to find food, but not so late in spring or summer that the young don't have time to grow up and become relatively independent by the end of summer and fall um, before they have to survive the next winter. So we start seeing pairs of foxes, which is very cool on the cameras in February and March. Males following females around, um, folks digging dens, burrowing down into the snow, curled up together. Very sweet. Next species, bats. Yet again, a totally different pattern. No photos at all from January till June, and then no photos again in November or December. What is going on here? Those times of year when we are not seeing bats, it's because there are no bats active on the landscape. Some of our bats migrate, others of them go into what's called torpor, which is like hibernation light for the winter. Um, so they'll go into caves or for most of the bats at Cedar Creek into tree cavity roosts and they just kind of hang out all winter. They slow their metabolism way down. They slow their body temperature way down. So we don't see bats during these times of year. And we know, for example, from this data, we want to study bats. There's really no point in going out like in May even. You really don't start seeing bats on the landscape until June. And really there becomes a peak in July. The opposite pattern of that is deer. Not too surprising. Deer are active year round. They are all over Cedar Creek. Um, they are in front of every single camera um, doing all sorts of interesting things. We've seen deer mating. We've seen deer shortly after their have get, they have given birth. So we've seen deer where the fawn still has placenta and umbilical cord attached. We've seen Deer with triplets. We've seen deer standing up on their back legs to try and reach cedar trees um, to get a bite to eat during the winter. So all times of the year, deer are around. Um, and that makes them a great study subject for one of our next questions. So there are deer everywhere. That gives us an opportunity to study something called trophic cascades. Um, this is a concept that you're probably familiar with, even if you've never heard the term trophic cascade. Um, so this is basically the idea that when you change one thing in a system, um, everything else kind of has a ripple effect on out to it. Um, the classic example of this involving wolves and deer is the studies that have been done in Yellowstone, where when wolves were reintroduced, they shifted the behavior of deer and of elk. That um, kind of released from herbivory 
lots of trees and bushes that were previously being eaten down to nothing um, by the elk. So you saw a decrease in elk, an increase in certain types of vegetation. Um, that can then change things all the way out to the way that rivers flow and erosion dynamics happen because those trees along the river shore are stabilizing the banks since they're not being eaten down to nothing. Um, so this, this idea that you change one thing and you get ripple effects is called a trophic cascade. We we wanted to study this at Cedar Creek because we know that we do have wolves around um, and we took advantage of the fact that we have very few wolves around most of the time to set up a really nicely controlled experimental look at trophic cascades. Um, so Dr. Meredith Palmer, who I showed on a previous slide, uh, discover that you can order literally anything, including wolf urine on the internet. Um, bought a bunch of wolf urine, um, set up these fences, and basically made it seem like there were wolves in really specific parts of the property by going around with a little spritzer and spritzing wolf urine around these fences. You can, it smells as bad as you would expect. I see your face, Emma. It smells just as bad as you would expect. Not a fun job in the height of summer. Um, but very effective. So you can you can induce what's called the landscape of fear. Um, you can make it seem like a wolf is there, even if a wolf isn't actively eating the deer. And our thought was, you know, spray this wolf urine around that would make our local deer population think that they were in danger. And that would then change the way that they behaved. That might change, well, all sorts of things. It might mean that they avoid the areas where wolf urine is and go and find their food somewhere where wolf urine isn't. It could mean that they change when they're active. It could mean they change how they behave. We could see no response at all. Maybe deer are smart enough to know that wolf urine doesn't always mean wolf, might mean human with spray bottle. I'd love to know what you think um, what your hypothesis is about how deer might respond to this wolf urine treatment. These are all legitimate answers, by the way. These are all things that we went into this project considering. So if some of them seem far-fetched, I promise they are based in like real scientific thought. Um, and you can pick the one that seems most logical to you. I'm honestly surprised by some of the answers coming in. I'm excited to share it. Because there's one that is getting zero love whatsoever, and I'm interested to know why. <laughs> We've got a couple more, and then we'll hit 80%. I wish there was a way that I could, I mean, I guess you could drop in the chat if you have other ideas about how deer might respond. I won't be able to see them, but Emma will, and she can always let me know. Yeah, I can read them out loud. I'm ready. curious about the one that is getting no love. I wonder which one <laughs> It's funny because after I answered, I have another uh, screen going so I can answer as a attendee and watch the watch the site. I'm curious if it's the one that I I wanted to go back and change my answer, and now I'm like, oh wait, no one likes that answer. Maybe it's okay. <laughs> Don't give in to peer pressure, Emma. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll so you can see the results. Shared, sure. There we go. Yes. Yeah, so okay. That's, that's open font. It's got no love. Nobody thinks the wolves are smart enough to know that wolf pee does not mean a wolf. Congratulations, you're all correct. We definitely did see a response. Most of you thought that deer were going to avoid the area and forage elsewhere. This is what we thought as well. This was kind of our leading hypothesis. But really interestingly, deer did not avoid the area. They did those other two things. They changed the timing of their activity and they changed how they behaved. So I'll show you some results. This was a really cool and really surprising um, set of answers for us. We sort of figured it would be, you know, the, the most obvious thing. You think there's danger here, you go to a different restaurant. Um, Here's a graph that shows what's called dial visitation rate. So over the course of a day, um, how much time are deer spending at these areas that have urine added or are just kind of a fenced area with no urine added, the control. Um, so the purple, purplish blue wavy line um, shows what deer do at Cedar Creek 
when there are no like wolf signals around. Um, and what we see is that deer tend to forage in the mornings, in the evenings, and overnight. Um, so very low on that, if you follow with your eyes, the, the blue dotted line, um, very low activity rates between about 8 p.m. and 4, or 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. A big peak in the evening um, and a big peak early in the morning. When you spray wolf urine around, you get what's in the pink. You get a decrease in activity overnight, a decrease in morning and evening activity, and an increase in activity during the day. This is really interesting because it really nicely matches when wolves are actively out hunting. Um, by far, when we get pictures of wolves, by far those pictures happen in the mornings and evenings or overnight. We've very rarely gotten like beautiful full color middle of the day wolf pictures and the deer are picking up on that. Without there actually being a wolf in the area, they know what times of day are dangerous and they know that it's not worth giving up their favorite lunch spot, or I guess their favorite breakfast spot. They just shift the timing of their breakfast. They also change kind of their perception of risk. So this graph shows when deer have their heads up and are being vigilant. So watching out on the landscape for predators like wolves. Um, again, in blue, that bluish purple, when there is no wolf urine and in red when there is wolf urine. The only place where this is really significant is at dawn. Um, in those low light, kind of hard to see, often at Cedar Creek in the summer, foggy mornings, the deer are spending a lot of their morning time with their head up, looking around, scanning the landscape for predators. Then they stick their head back down, take a quick bite, stick their head back up and look around. We also see that maybe they're being more vigilant during the day. Um, this one was not quite significant, very close. It's hard to compare because there's so few images of deer at these locations during the day when there is no urine added, um, that the comparison gets a little bit challenging statistically. But we do see, especially early in the morning, this change in vigilance behavior. So deer are responding, and the cameras show us kind of in more fine detail than expected how they're responding. The next thing to do is start looking at plant growth. Um, we did that and the results were not that interesting, so I don't actually have a graph of them. Um, but the reason that they're not that interesting makes sense because deer are still coming to these locations and eating. It's not like they are totally avoiding them the way we had thought. They are still there. They are still eating the plants down. So plants get eaten at about the same rates with and without deer urine. Um, now we're also moving on to analyze soil to see if there's any impacts on soil because plants have impacts on soil and if deer have impacts on plants, maybe we'll see that happen too. Not many interesting results there yet either, again, because the deer are still eating plants in all of these locations. But the cameras give us a chance to really start digging in um, to some of these, some of these nuances. Okay, so those are some results. Now some nitty gritty. Um, how our project works is a few steps that are done by the researchers, basically going out in the field, collecting those cards and metadata, doing the downloads, doing the uploads, um, and moving things over onto the Zooniverse, which is the platform that hosts our project. SciStarter will connect you there. Um, this is where we are right now at this exact moment. Uh, we were we had downloaded everything locally to the hard drive and in the process of uploading to the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute for Processing is where we found out that some of those files were corrupted. So we're here right now, um, but we hope very soon we will be slightly further down in the part where volunteers get involved. So these kind of later steps are where you come in. Um, when you go to the interface, which we'll show you in just a moment, you'll be presented with a little trio of pictures um, taken one after another on one of these cameras. And depending on what workflow you, you're in, you might be asked, is there an animal in this picture? Easy yes or no question. Um, or you might be asked what animal you see 
um, and given a list of options. And then you can pick, I see a deer, and it will ask you, how many? Does it have antlers? Do you see any fawns? Some other specific questions that help us with our research. The great thing about these kind of crowdsourced citizen science projects is you don't need to be an expert. So I know we have someone calling in from Turkey. You may not be familiar with Minnesotan wildlife if you live in Turkey. I know I am not familiar with Turkish wildlife, um, but that's okay. You can still participate. Um, there are tutorials and guides that help you narrow down what animals you see to the proper ID. And there are always going to be other people looking at the same photos. So you don't need to worry if your ID is not correct. Um, take your best guess. Honestly, that's what the North American people are doing too. I know very few North Americans, including some of those like foremost experts in the field who can tell a coyote from a wolf in a picture taken in the snow in the dark of a moving animal. Um, I've had people who are experts misidentify fishers as otters. So you're in good company if you're just taking your best guess and that's all we ask. Okay. What will you be joining if you join this project? How many people do you think have volunteered on this project since we launched it at the end of 2018? Are you gonna be like an early adopter in that first thousand? Are you gonna be jumping on the bandwagon and you think we have 50,000? How good do you think Kaylin has been at promoting this project over the last few years? We are now evaluating you at your job. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> We got, oh, we're at 84%. Any last takers? Five, four, three, two. All right. Nice. How we do? Hey, look at that. We are just almost to 17,000. Um, I checked this morning and it's like 16,700 and something. So if you all and your friends all get on when we have pictures again to classify, you can push us over that 17,000 mark. Our volunteers come from all over. We've had volunteers from all 50 US states, um, some states more than others. I had to work really hard to get this last state. I had to like tap some serious networks to find someone to classify in one of these three states. Any guesses as to which? We have a lot of people going for the same answer, which I find interesting. We're at 68%, 73%, 84%. Any last takers? Three, two. All right. You're correct. It took us several years to find a Mississippian. Turns out not many people in Minnesota know many people in Mississippi, I think, but a fantastic master's student studying wildlife um, named Isabella in Mississippi nicely volunteered her time and became our first Mississippian. Um, here's a heat map that shows kind of the distribution of our volunteers domestically. You can see a hot spot in Minnesota, which makes sense. Can also see a hot spot in California, which is where I am from. Um, so a lot of my personal network, I think, got bullied into doing this. But I was really, really happy when we were able to color in that Mississippi spot on the map. I'm honestly a little surprised by the amount of people in Texas. That seems like a lot of uh, volunteers. Is there a different network that is there, or is that just kind of random? I honestly have no idea. So this is a statistic called unique page views. So this tries to be like the number of unique browser sessions um, from a like a given state based on IP address. So it could be as simple as like a professor in an ecology class at Texas A&M told their, you know, 1000 level students that they all needed to do this citizen science project for one day and 500 people did it once, um, or it could be a small number of really dedicated folks. I have no idea why so many in Texas or New York. I don't have a lot of personal connections to either of those states, so don't know. <laughs> It's not just the US. Um, we have volunteers from, I think at last count, 
140 odd countries. So most of the world has classified at some point on this project. Outside of the US, which country do you think has submitted the most classifications? So the other end of the spectrum from my Mississippi question. There are specific ones. Oh, just kidding. Just one specifically not getting any love, which is interesting because of the, the climate in this <laughs> space. We're at 84%. Any last takers? Five, four, three, two. All right. Uh, I feel like. Very interesting. Are we wrong? <laughs> no, the answer is the Netherlands. Oh. Um, so, I mean, you could not be wrong because, well, I guess you could be wrong if it was Russia, but it was not Russia. Um, it was the Netherlands. Um, so six of you guessed correctly. Um, and I do know why the Netherlands. Um, it's because there is one very sweet super volunteer named Yolanda who lives in the Netherlands and honestly has classified more images on this project than anybody in history, including the researchers who do this for our job. Um, she she sits in her like townhouse with her cat and her cup of coffee and classifies in the morning. And sometimes she sends me letters and it's amazing. Um, so I think Netherlands is because of Yolanda. Um, but you can see India actually has quite a few classifications as well. Um, there are a few countries in Africa, particularly in West Africa, um, where we have not had people log in from, but we do have most of the rest of the world. It's always really fun to have folks from Australia join the project. For some reason, there's a handful of Australian volunteers who really love raccoons. Um, and they are the reason that I have so many great raccoon pictures for my presentations because they do a phenomenal job of commenting on raccoon pictures and getting really, really excited about them. So if you join this project, um, you are joining a wide network that is truly global and is really helping us advance our understanding of North American landscapes. Um, as I mentioned, we upload images several times during the year. So there may be things to do, there may not. Um, anywhere that you have internet, you're welcome to join this. Um, the link that's on the screen is the direct link to the project, but I would recommend that you instead follow Emma's great steps here. Um, because this will allow you to track your classifications um, and kind of save your, your project and get back to it easily via the SciStarter dashboard. Um, so I want to, I think at this point, turn it over to Emma to say a few things about SciStarter. Um, I know that I have been talking for a long time. I'm happy to show you the interface and answer questions, but I want to make sure she does her good SciStarter instructions if people have to leave in four minutes. Thanks so much. I actually, I mean, I couldn't have done it better myself with describing this page. Um, that is exactly what you should do if you are a SciStarter account holder. That means that this affiliate, SciStarter affiliate label uh, basically means that your contributions will be tracked. You'll get to know how many times you contribute, which is really cool. Um, it allows you to be able to um, essentially just kind of prove how much you've done. Um, so if any of you are involved in service or you just are curious about your own data, then it's absolutely a good thing to do. Um, you just have to make sure to, that that step two is done. That same email as your SciStarter account is the big thing that connects the two. So other than that, though, that's a that's a big, big part of it. Um, I'm going to steal your screen share really fast. Oh, yeah. And then did it work? Oh, you just see a lot of things, actually. Let's stop that share. <laughs> Too many things. Um, you only need to see this. Is it the wrong one again? Oh, no, we're good. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so because there isn't a new slew of, of uh, pictures right now, they're still in the process of getting that corrupted data back. Um, I'm not going to have us go to this website, but if you are curious, you can go around um, the website that's on to it. will also take you, I think, to the instant while, or sorry, it'll take you to Zooniverse, which has a bunch of projects. So you'll have, you'll find related projects there too in the meantime. But if you save that project to your dashboard on SciStarter, we'll make sure to send you a message when all those photos get added, um, so, or videos and photos uh, get added so that you can uh, take a look yourself. They look like videos, but they're pictures. Over Little trios. That's right. Okay. That makes more sense. I was like, there's something wrong here. Um, if there are any leftover questions, we're happy to hear them now. Um, we only have a few moments, but I know there were a couple questions I wanted to address that I saw. Um, there was a question about the deer and the wolves. 
Um, yeah. Did we see a difference in wolf behavior too when there was urine involved or did they just not care because it was basically familiar? Yeah, we, so I think they would care um, because it was wolf urine bought off the internet and so not wolf urine from like the pack um, in the local area. We did that experiment during a time when there were no wolves on the Cedar Creek property. Um, so we have, we don't have like a resident wolf pack. We just kind of have transient individuals over time. Um, and we picked a time where the wolf activity was extremely low um, so that we could control where the signal was. But absolutely, I would expect that there would be a change in wolf activity. And it would have been really interesting to see if there were a, like a pack of wolves on the property at the time we were putting out wolf urine, what they did. I feel like some of those same hypotheses I could see holding true for wolves as well, that they might completely avoid the area because they didn't want to get into a territorial fight. They might be attracted to that area because there were interlopers in their spots. <laughs> they might change their behavior and maybe spend more time remarking and peeing themselves in those areas where we had applied urine. So maybe if we have another kind of like high wolf activity time period, uh, we'll have to do the experiment again. Yeah, that is very interesting. I'm curious. I guess we'll find out hopefully in the future. Um, excellent. Uh, if there are any more questions, you're welcome to drop them in the chat. If we can't answer any by the end too, I, I noted this earlier, but we will send a message, um, the follow-up email with some of the other resources too that were mentioned. I know you mentioned education resources. Oh yeah. Uh, Let me you... see if I can find the link and drop it in the chat right now. Awesome. That would be great. Um, so if any of you are teachers or interested in teaching others <laughs> or sharing, sharing it with your children's teachers and whatnot, um, you're welcome to use those things or just do it for yourself. Why not? Um, and I'll um, put my email in the chat as well. Um, I'm just Caitlin at UMN, University of Minnesota .edu. Um, And if you email me, if you're a teacher or you know teachers, um, I'm happy to connect you to our education team and they can set up a virtual field trip or an in-person field trip if you're local. Um, that link will take you to two folders, um, one that's materials for this Eyes on the Wild project and the other that are materials for another trail camera project that we use or that we run, which I mention um, because it does have pictures at the moment. Um, so if you want to play with that, there is a woodpecker project as well. I don't know if I've gotten it up on SciStarter yet, so I won't put its direct link in, um, but it does exist <laughs> and there are resources. I think we do have the woodpecker one on site starter. If, um, okay. uh, we can talk afterwards and I'll make sure it's in the follow-up email too. Cause I've, I've used that one as, as an example cause it's a really easy one to show people for like five minutes and have a good time. So I uh, would recommend questions. fully. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. So if there are any questions you can let us know via email. Hey, so I'll send you all the resources and, um, and I'll show you a couple more things just so you're aware. We're a minute after, so I'll be brief, but we have these pretty much every week. Um, we are going to be promoting specific ones instead of being live with people in the future. So just be aware of that. Like next week, we have technically an encore episode. So we'll be listening to um, some of our previous one about sea bark for dog day. Um, so we'll be learning about canine research. However, and this was leading up to that for that reason, uh, but we also have the uh, special guest of Dr. Serple who was with us last year. He's coming back to answer Q&A. So if any of you have dogs, come on back. We'd love to see you and talk to you about your dogs. At the end, we will probably allow everyone to like turn their cameras on so you can show off your lovely puppy who's a part of your, of your family and your lab partner. Lab partner. <laughs> um, after that, we're going to be talking about mosquitoes, which are super irritating all the time. So if you're irritated and want to learn more, please join us. They're not all irritating. That's what I've learned recently from working with that group as well and knowing like how crazy they are in addition to having like disease spreading situations going on. There's more to them than meets the eye, so to speak. Um, so if you want to learn more or if you need more information on a given day, we have the blog that is updated with our next events and such, and uh, we'll keep doing that. And you can also register for pretty much all of them at the same link, um, which I will have uh, Roland write down as well because I can't type and talk at the same time. Um, so the last thing I will mention, we do have a separate series with NASA called Do NASA Science Live, where we talk about different NASA projects. You are more than welcome to join. It takes place sometimes on Tuesdays or random days, um, but it takes the place of this event in a week. So the next one coming up is in September. If you plan on participating in the eclipse or trying to participate as a citizen scientist, or just wanna see the eclipse and you're in the path, and you're like, yeah, this is gonna be great. 
You should totally join us to learn more about what's going on during the eclipse and why it's so important in uh, the grand scheme of understanding our universe, because it's our opportunity to really learn more about the sun. So if you care about the sun, um, you should totally join. Uh, lastly, and then I'll just show you all these resources. Um, you have access to a bunch of things as a SciStarter account holder, so we really do encourage you to join um, if you're not already there. Uh, you can find projects, you can take a training, you can ask the project leaders or ask the communities, you can talk to us. Um, and you can listen to our podcasts, et cetera. So just be aware of how many resources you have available to you. And we'd love to see you on there. So next week, we look forward to seeing you um, for that dog day one. And we do have a survey that we'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, we look at those every week. So I'd appreciate your thoughts on what to do um, next too. So if you have any ideas or you're just like, wait, this would be great for, or if you're that project leader and you're still here and you're like, I want to participate, let me know. <laughs> Feel free to send us an email too if you want. Awesome. All right. That's all I have for you. So I'm going to go ahead and drop my share so you can see all of this. Um, I'm so glad all of you could be here today and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Any final thoughts you can drop in the chat or any questions, let us know. Otherwise, um, I will say goodbye to Facebook first, I suppose, uh, which Roland, I hope I'm not cutting them off if any of them are saying anything in the comments. But we'll Thank you all very much for, for coming. Um, I probably added a few too many videos didn't give Emma much time at the end, um, but I really appreciate you all being here. Hope, hope to see you on the project. Um, leave a question, leave a comment on a picture you see, and hopefully I will see it and respond. Yes, Grace! I thought I recognized your name, but then I was like, am I making up because there's another Grace who's an intern? Um, oh. <laughs> awful wildlife watching is also very cool. Trail cameras on gut piles and all the interesting things that come and eat what gets left behind after people go hunting. Wait, trail piles? What did you say? Gut <laughs> piles. Trail cameras looking at gut piles. So after yeah. like a hunter kills a deer and field dresses it and leaves the pile of bits and pieces behind, Grace et al. Um, set up trail cameras and you can see all the interesting predators and scavengers and everything else out there. Yeah, get on SciStarter. SciStarter is where it's at. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Please do. Um, wow. Okay, well, that's incredible. See, it's every every time, every week, I'm just like, oh, there's something new. I like it's every three seconds. I'm like, oh, that is an interesting method slash I did not know that you learned so much. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, and I learned so much and I love those videos and I'm definitely sending everyone that um, the coyote nap time video because uh, it really made me happy. <laughs> it's just so relatable. I love it so much. And I feel like every time I watch it, I see something new. Like this time I noticed he or she picks up like a stick or something and carries it along the log. Oh, when the coyote finally is. gets up, he like picks up something in his mouth, also just like a dog. <laughs> Amazing. Great segue into our next week. So yes. <laughs> happy hey. early dog day, everyone. And we will see you hopefully next week um, and the next and then the next and et cetera. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, Facebook. Bye, everyone. Goodbye, recording. <laughs>